Okay, next I'm going to talk to you about what I call the life from the start to the finish of a buck. We'll take Stumpy here for example. Now his mother probably, the doe, probably had him in late May according to when she got bred or the middle of June. Now when that little buck was born, he wouldn't even hardly stand. For the first two weeks of his life, he has no scent whatsoever, none. He learns who his mother is by her calls and bleats and whatever she does. He recognizes that and if she will make him lay down in a spot, he won't move. He'll lay there till he's starved to death. He won't move. And she'll go off and feed to build up her milk supplies. And when she comes back to feed that little buck, she'll make a little squeaking noise or a, or a blat like a sheep. And he knows that's his mother. When she gets to the full close, he'll jump up and go run into her and put the milk right to him. That gives him that start. That first two weeks with no scent. If he lays there and don't move, the predator's not going to smell him. The only way they're going to get him, if they get so close to him, he gets nervous and don't hold his ground by laying still and gets up and run. It's all over for that little buck. But if he don't do that, that predator pretty well got to step on that little deal before they get him. And I know a lot of them die that way. Because in the coyotes we've killed over the years, you see the little horse and stuff that they can't digest in their stomach. Still in the stomach of these coyotes. So a lot now are losing the lives because of the plentiness of coyotes in our area. But if that little buck makes it through that stage and gets strong and starts chasing his mother around and gets his strength and starts feeding on his own, that next fall he's going to be a little spike horn. And if he's got the generics in him, like Stumpy, probably, you know, a healthy looking spike horn. And he survives that fall and when up, we don't have a bad winter or nothing happens to him. The next year he probably might bump it up to a big four or maybe even a six pointer with the looks of a, you know, a handsome young buck. He's got everything going for him. He's got the generics. Then if he survives through that winter, there's a lot of things here that can end this deer's life at any time. But if he does survive, the next thing you know, within four years, there he is. A four-year-old, mature, beautiful animal, ready to start breeding with does. And that is when things start coming downhill for him. Because he'll chase these does till the end of the rut. And from a 214-pound animal, which Stumpy was when I shot him, he will run himself down and probably lose anywhere from 40 to 50 pounds within a month. When he even stop to eat, just straight go chasing does. Then, if winter comes in quick and cold and snow, he's in big trouble. He's got to get his strength build back up for that miserable winter ahead of him. And if he's run down so low, which this buck would probably survive it, right? Because he's a young buck. Get his strength back. But you put three or four more years on him and he's starting to go the other way and he's getting older and weaker and he gets run down just so bad. A lot of them don't make it if, if the winter shuts on them early. They, they just can't get back. They're so weak. They're run down so low. They can't get at the feed. The snow is too deep. And I imagine they end up being a supper for coyotes because they just can't. They just can't. And that's the end of him. That's it. So if you're lucky, you get him when he's this age. Beautiful, prime, mature, young buck. Perfect buck you want for breeding your does. The generics is there, everything is there. And that is the time, if you're lucky enough to get one, that's the time to get him. But the life of a deer, from the time he's born till the time he's either shot or his life ends in the woods, boy, is a hard old battle for him. It always don't work out, but there's some that does make it, and I guess apparently Stumpy was one of them. He made it to be, anyway, to what he is right there, a mature buck. Now, what was what was going to happen to him after that? Well, that was for Mother Nature to decide, I guess, but he hasn't got to worry about it anymore. He's on the wall, so, and I enjoy having him there, so. But anyway, that's a little story that I think you should know about the life of a deer.
It ain't all roses. There's a lot of battles they got to fight and win, and a lot of them don't make it. But some do, and a good thing to do, because we wouldn't have no deer hunting. So that will be the end of this little session, I guess. Okay, the next subject I'm going to be talking on here is uh, very important. He's going to let you know what you're hunting here. The next time you get a nice buck down, before you field dress him, just take a minute and look at that beautiful animal and, 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 and come to uh, realize that this animal is built to survive. He's got everything he needs. His eyesight. He can see you a mile away and you would never even know you was there. You wouldn't have an idea. He could hear a mouse squeak a mile away if he wanted to zone in on it. But them ears are built just like uh, satellite dishes. There is nothing that they don't hear. They got to have that to survive. The scent of smell. I don't know how far. I think he smells you when you leave the house in the morning if he wanted to. So don't kid yourself. They know you're there. It's up to you to be a little foxy and try to try to cut down on some of this. But like I said, by not making yourself so visible in the woods that he's going to see you. Be quiet enough so you stand a chance that he don't hear you. And if you want to use the cover sense and stop it, that'll help you keep him from smelling you. But one thing I have noticed about scents when laying in a tree stand, if you can get to your tree stand and get up in it, especially in the morning, so you notice how the frost and the mess rises out of the ground as the sun comes up. That's to your advantage in the morning. Because also you're up there 15, 18 foot or 20 foot in that tree stand. Your scent also is rising up with the morning heat. He ain't going to smell you. Because everything is getting up above. And the deer rarely looks up because they have no threat from above. And uh, so that's to your advantage. In the evenings now, things start coming down a bit because as darkness comes on, things start settling again and your scent will kind of be going down, down, down towards the ground more. And another part about these, these things that deer's got for them so they can survive. The next time you get one down, I want you to take a minute and go to one of his front feet, spread his hooves apart, in that light hair and look up inside there and see what you're going to be looking at and I'll tell you what you're going to be looking at you're going to be looking at a little round yellow pad kind of leathery looking all full of little holes and I know a good many of you out there has had a deer staring you down stomping its front feet in the ground and you're saying why in the devil is that deer stomping his front feet well, that is why he's stomping his front feet. You're dealing with something that ain't only got two ears. They got four ears. They got an ear in each front foot. And that stomping, that vibration, will go through the ground and let every other deer that's close in that area know there's danger in the area. So if you're going through the woods, thumping the heel of your boot in the rocks and in the stump roots and every log and bush, and think you're being quiet, I got news for you. You just let every deer within 300 yards know that you're there. Because you're dealing with a very smart animal here. He ain't stomping that foot because he's scared of you. He's stomping that foot because he's going to let the other deer in the area know that you're there. You look the next time and see what I'm telling you. You look up inside that front hoof, spread it apart and have a look and see what you see. You're going to see another set of ears that you didn't even know this animal had so we ain't just playing with some dumb creature here this boy is built to survive he wants to survive and you got to be just a little smarter than he is to get him and a lot of us ain't okay next I'm going to talk about is deer communication different sounds they make from calling a calf or a buck, calling a doe or getting aggressive with another buck or a doe in heat, 
bleating for a, for a buck to come to her. You'll hear these sounds. Now when the coyotes first come into our area, we was hearing deer blowing. As soon as you heard a coyote howl, it would be whew, over in this edge of the big woods. Then it'd be whew, way over here. Then it'd be whew, way off in the distance. You know, I'm talking probably quarter mile radius around me. And I said, what are the deer doing? They all heard them coyotes howling, getting ready to bunch up to go on a hunting pack. And those deer were letting each other know where they was at that time, that they all heard these coyotes. And we noticed it more and more and more, and it made the deer more nervous. We were seeing last deer, they got nervous, they didn't want to come out like we were seeing them any time of the day. But that's some of the sounds you'll hear, and you'll hear a deer, a deer will blow when she smells you, or a buck smells you, and runs from you, they'll and off they go, the tail lapped up, or going and bouncing, and all you'll see is the east end of a westbound deer. That's letting you know that that deer has scented you, she's running from you, or he's running from you. But the other calls you'll hear, if you're in the woods a lot like I've been over the years, is uh, in the spring of the year, sometimes you'll see a doe calling to its calf. I see them out in these little meadows and stuff when the grass turns green in the early spring. And like any little, little youngster, the calf will get away from its mother a little bit. And she'll look back, and there he is, probably 40, 50 yards out of the side of her, where she'll make a little mat sound like that. And that little calf recognizes his mother's voice, he'll look over and he'll, it isn't very loud, you gotta go have good ears to hear that, but it's just a little meh, just a little squeaky kind of a sound, just like a, a, a baby sheep, probably, a little lamb would make. And that's letting his mother know, well, I see you, I know where you are, and they'll communicate that way. Now when fall comes, you're going to hear some different sounds. Mostly in the box, there's two major ones, like I described to you before about the grunt calls you'll hear. Just because it sounds loud don't mean it's a big buck. But these bucks will make that uh, uh, sound like that. So let a doe know he's on a trail. Then you'll get two bucks eyeing each other up that might turn into a major scrap to figure out who's got the dominance in that area, you'll hear that they call it a snort wheeze. Well that's just letting that one of the bucks letting the other buck know you ain't gonna put up with this no more. You're gonna have it out right here and we're gonna have it out right here and there. And it's a lot of guys, I've never used one myself, but a lot of guys use these snort wheeze. It will bring an aggressive buck in thinking there's another buck in the area that wants to fight for him. You know, fight for his dogs. And I myself, I've never heard it really that much in, in the wild, but I guess it does happen a lot, this snort wheezing. Then again in the late fall when the rut is in full tilt, I see single does walking along and be ready because I said, well, there's going to be a buck right behind her. That doe's in heat, there's going to be a buck coming behind her somewhere. Here, hopefully before it gets dark or whatever. And she'll go along and next thing you know, she'll just stop and lift the head up and go, meh. Well, I said, what's she doing? And it took me the longest while to figure out there was no buck in that area, probably right there where she was. She's in full estrus, probably going to only be in there for two days, three days, and she's going to go out until the next time. She's calling for a buck to come and breed her. Simple as that. And, and, and it's a noise that these bleak calls, I call them, doe and heat bleak calls, imitate to the T. It's a meh, long, dragged out bleak. And if there's a buck anywhere in the area, well, there is they got. I'm sure they're going to hear it. And if I was a buck in the woods and heard a doe doing that to me, I'd be coming with trees and everything going right out over top of my back just to get there. So when you hear that sound, you want to get ready. It might be a buck or it might be me. Okay, now we're going to go into a big buck behavior. And when it comes to the rut and, and rest of the year, really, is... Uh, a lot of times you're probably in the woods in the early summer or late to early fall 
August to September. And I know one time we, me and one of my hunting buddies, Walton Smith, was down getting some firewood cut for the fall hunt. We went for a walk one morning early. And, you know, and then it was uh, getting around towards the first week of September. And we was walking along this meadow and swale and all of a sudden Walton stops and Freddie looked there. And there they was. Five mature bucks. All big bodied animals. Horns, some had some velvet starting to come off. Big main beam racks, beautiful looking bucks. The work of them was all from eight to ten pointers, all together. There they was, just like cattle you see in a farmer's field, feeding around in this meadow out next to this brook. And well, they figured it out of sight, and we just stood there amazed by it. But that will change within a month. When you start getting into late October, when things start changing, the weather gets cooler. They've rubbed that velvet off the horns. You ain't going to see those five bucks together anymore. They'll start getting out on their own, getting down the hooking lines and the scrape lines and stuff out. And when they do meet each other again, it ain't on a friendly basis. They're going to square off and going to find out who the dominant buck is in this area. Because they banned the whole five of them was in that same area all summer. And everybody thinks two big bucks squaring off into a, a fighting match. Well, if you never see it, I've never seen it, but I see where they have banned fighting, ground all tore up, looked like somebody banned there with a teller, hair, blood, I even found a end of a, one of the points off of one of the bucks horns, I don't know, they got them locked together and broke one off. But it's not so much as a driving the horns into each other as it is a shoving match. And that's why they'll hawk in the late fall. They'll hawk big trees, little trees. They're going to build them neck muscles up. And them neck muscles are the purpose for fighting. Them two big bucks are going to rack them horns together and they're going to start pushing each other. One will push one way and one will push the other way. And the one that's the strongest is going to end up pushing the weaker one down. And he's going to get to his feet and he's going to take off the other way. And that bigger buck's going to take on to him and he's going to drive him out of there. Probably ain't going to have to worry about him that fall. Where he was the best of friends all summer. Now I imagine a good many of us growing up in a life done the same thing when it comes to a, a girlfriend. Well, you probably had to fight some guys off just to get to talk to her. But same basic idea. He's fighting for dominance in that area. And Mother Nature has made it that way. So the dominant buck mates with the doe. The bloodline continues on. She has strong, healthy calves. Only mating with dominant bucks. And a lot of does want le uh, lesser buck mate with her. I've seen spike horns sneaking around with dominant bucks. Good many times I've killed a big buck with a doe. Went over there, the doe has run off. Now lays my buck. Something catches my eye and I look standing there and there stands the spike horn. Well, why was he there? I'll tell you why. Sometimes when these two big boys are and that spike horn standing there sees these other two bucks to one side of the doe having it out over the dominance over that doe in heat. He gets things just right. He's going to sneak out there and he's going to try to breed that doe. Now what will happen majority of the times is he tries the doe ain't going to have nothing to do with him because nature is built into that doe that she knows she should be mating with the dominant buck to, to carry the bloodline on and she'll just slide right from underneath him and take. Then about that time the old big dominant buck's going to see that spike horn, see what he's up to and he's going to take on to him and drive him to one side. So, but that's what will happen. Sometimes you keep watching, I mean many of you see it. Drop a big buck. Doe runs off, you go over there to see what kind of a buck you got, and, and, and you look, and there stands a spike horn. And you'll say to yourself, well, what in the devil is that little spike horn chasing that big buck around for? You get his butt kicked, all he's going to get. But he ain't worried about getting his butt kicked. He's worried about getting a chance at that doe. So even the little bucks, they know what's going on, the rock. Now I'm going to talk about deer and animals in Pacific, I guess, adapting to their surroundings. You take these two mounts here, the eight-pointer, look how light his horns is. 
who made of the hair and stuff is on his body. Now that buck was taken in an area that was open grassy meadows, that pretty brown meadow grass you see in the late fall, cranberry bogs mostly, and he was probably born and raised in that area and, 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 and grew up to be the nice buck he is there. And uh, so he would blend into that area, it'd be a little job to see him at times out in that meadow grass because he's the same color. Now the eleven pointer here, Stumpy, where he ended up and where I got him was out in that same type area as I just described to you as the eight pointer was in, but he didn't come from there. This buck was born and raised either in a big woods pine or a hemlock ridge that probably stretched for miles or down in some black spruce thicket. So that's why he's got the darker face a lot of dark hair running through his neck and his body so he would blend in, look how dark colored chocolatey brown horns he was adapting to, to survive in the area he raised up in where he grew up being a darker phase deer but he ended up out on the stump ridge around these big meadows, the only reason he was there was to chase the does around that was in heat but that's not where he was born and raised. That's where he ended up and that's where his life ended up there. But there's a deer will adapt. Same thing when we first started hunting down where we hunt now. When they drained the lake back, it was all muck. You'd walk along, the next thing you know, you'd go right to your crotch and muck. And we noticed the deer we was killing had these great big humongous hoofs on them like caribou hair and all, and we couldn't figure out what it was. Well, those deer had adapted to trying to walk up on that muck without getting bogged down every other step. Now, over the last 30 years in that area, the muck has turned to hard ground. It's turned to grassy meadows, young pines starting to grow in it. And I've noticed the last 10 years, the buck's feet are getting smaller again in that area because they don't need those great big wide snowshoe shaped pads on the feet to carry them over mucky conditions. It's hardened up now so animals adapt to their surroundings or no matter where they are they will adapt to the area they're in either by color or something to do with them that will blend them in and make it easier for them to survive in that area. Now I want to talk a bit on what I call natural predators that deer have. Now deer will treat us as a predator. If they smell us or see us, they're going to run from us. Because they see us as a threat. Even though we're not a natural predator, to them, we are danger. There's so many things out there now that wasn't there even a few years ago, but they've always had natural predators around them. But you've got more abundance of coyotes, and I've noticed the last few years the bears. The bear population is getting so thick, especially in the area that I hunt in, it's unreal. They're numerous. They're everywhere now. They're a great threat to newborn calves in the spring of the year laying around in these little grassy meadows laying there waiting for the mother to come back to feed them. We're not seeing no calves, like we used to. Rarely, and I talked to guys good many times in the fall, hundreds of pictures of does on the trail cameras, not a calf. So this is getting to be a problem. Where is our next generation of buck we're going to be coming from here? If these natural predators, which never was a big threat to them, but always a threat, always there, and them always looking for them, they're getting to be more and more and more every year. Way too many bear. We don't have a spring bear season no more to thin some of these bear out. They took that away from us. And some of these predators, I know a lot of the trappers and the coyote hunters are doing the best they can. But you know yourself, you're never going to kill the coyote population off. The more you kill, the more they breed if the feed's there. But the end getting to be something that's really going to put a big impact on a deer herd especially if our bad winters come back. We've had good winters in southwest Nova Scotia for the last few years. Hardly see enough snow to make a snowman anymore. Deer are surviving more, but if you throw back in them bad winters, 
two or three real bad winters with a lot of snow and the predators that's going to be out in the winter, not the bears because he's hibernating, but the coyotes. Then does are going to have calves in their belly. And when late winter comes on, they're really getting swelled out with the calf in the stomach. And if you, if a coyote forces that doe through deep snow in a long period of running, that's going to take a big impact on her having a miscarriage and dropping that calf before it's time for it to be born. Because it's just too much for her to run through deep snow every jump she makes. She just, she just can't do it. She, it's too much for them. So we got to take into consideration about pressing our natural resources department and stuff to give us some a little more time to thin out some of these bears. A spring bear hunt and an extra bear hunt in the fall or something to uh, thin some of these predators out, make it a little easier on the deer herd. They got enough to put up with. <coughs>
It, it just can't happen. You can't kill off all your kids and have adults. It ain't gonna happen. So they say, man, boxes, good boxes, some surely ain't they? No, I said, well, yeah, they're gonna be for a long while. Because you can't kill them as spike horns and four pointers and have 12 pointers three or four years down the road. It ain't gonna happen. Now, one thing I want to make clear here, myself, I have never used bait, I have never laid over bait, I have never killed a deer over bait. I started my hunting career off in the backwoods and that's where I'm going to finish it. I've made that decision and I'm not going to change it. When it gets so I can't go in the backwoods anymore and hunt, I'll be done my hunting career handed the torch over to somebody else in the family, my grandsons and them. Now, bow hunters, you're not going to get off easy either. I know there's a lot of dedicated bow hunters out there that would be more than pleased to take a buck if they're lucky enough to get one with a bow. But what goes on, you know it as well as I know it. Shoot a deer with your bow, either try to sneak it home or bone it out in the woods and get it on the best way you can so you can buy a hunting license to go kill one with a big rifle too. And I'm going to admit to you, see as sure as I sit here, I'm just as guilty as, of this as the rest of us. Same thing with the rifle hunters. You kill a nice buck. Right in the first of the season you'll say, my dear, well I got the whole rest of the season, what am I going to do? Well I'll tell you what we all do. We get a friend or somebody to come in and take that buck for us, take it home, and you stay in the woods so you can kill another one. No, it's all right for us right now. But what I'm saying is what's going to be there next fall when you go back? And for the younger generation coming up, what's going to be left there for them? Nothing but bare woods. Deer, I thought we were supposed to be deer hunting here, not deer feeding. Deer don't have to be fed. They've been eating out in the woods for millions of years. If there was no feed for them, they'd all died off long ago. We don't have to feed them. They can eat anything they want. They know what they're eating and they know, and they know what's in season and what isn't. They'll go around like us looking for blueberries in the fall. If there's a special little treat comes right and gets just right, they're going to eat it. And that's the way deer live and they're always going to live that way. But that's what's happening. So far around here, this deer baiting, all I can see it doing is destroying the beautiful sport of deer hunting itself, because you're not hunting no more. You're crawling up a stand 25 yards off the woods and uh, sitting to a bait pile. And I know there's a lot of hunters out there that hate it. They tell me they hate laying the bait, but where their cottages and hunting camps is, they're forced to do it. Because if they don't put bait out too, they're not going to see a deer for the fall. But that's not what they want to be doing. They'd rather be back the old way of hunting. And these things all combined together is in a while it's just going to, as far as I'm concerned, it's going to destroy the sport itself. We got to get back to the way it was. Conservation. Kill a nice deer. If you like deer meat, it don't make no difference. It's your take. You can kill what you want. If you make a decision you want to kill a small buck for good eating purposes, fine, I got no problem with that. But just to kill one because you say, well, if I let it go to the next guy's bait pile, he's only going to shoot it. To me, that's not a decision that you should be making without thinking a bit. If we're all on the same page, you say, well, yeah, I can let that buck go because I know my buddy down there, he told me the same thing. He wasn't shooting no more spike, spike horns and four pointers over bait piles. He wanted to let them grow up to be bigger bucks. And if you're on that page, we're all on that same page, things will change. Our sons and our grandsons and the new upcoming hunters are going to have something to go in the woods to hunt for and give you something to think about. Like, you know, that's all, like, oh, that's all I want to say about that, that part of it. All right, now I'm going to try to uh, summarize the topics that we've talked about in this, this video. And uh, I'm going to start off with uh, deer hunting in general. This is not about killing a deer, in per se. 
It's about the love and the passion of hunting. The clean fresh air, the beautiful colors of the fall, the camp, the nice food, the partnership with your fellow hunters, the deer itself, if you're lucky enough to get one, is only a bonus that comes along with it. But you've got to have that love and that passion in your heart before you even start in this sport. And the next subject will be hunting gear and, and, and preparation. Be very, very careful when it comes to selecting your hunting gear. Make sure all the clothing you buy is what you want. If it's camouflage, make sure it's the colors you want to blend in with the area you hunt in. And you know you gotta have your hunter's orange with you and your, that's your hat and your vest that you have to wear is, is law. And your compass and your waterproof matches and everything else you need to survive. If something happens in the woods, you gotta have these things with you to spend a night in the woods. I've never had to do it yet. But I talked to guys that have, and it, it don't care how many years you've been in the woods, it's a scary situation. And be prepared for anything, because you don't know. You could fall, break a leg, all by yourself, you don't know. No way of getting a hold of anybody. You're going to have to spend the night in the woods. People are going to be looking for you, because they know you're supposed to be coming home. But you're going to be there until they come find you. And always let people know where you are hunting. Don't say I'm going to such and such a place for the day and change your mind on the way there and go somewhere else without letting one of your hunting partners or somebody know. Because if he thinks you're in this particular spot and you don't show up and they go there looking for you and don't find you, well how are they going to know where you are? If you change your plans, let somebody know by talking with them on the walkie talkie or your cell phone or whatever. But make sure people know where you are at all times. I don't care if you're young or old. Anything can happen at any time. And next subject, your hunting rifle and your bullets. Like I told you in this show, choose a rifle that is going to be for you, for the area you hunt in. And make sure it's what you want. You're going to invest a lot of money in this rifle and it's got to be for you. You're the one that's going to use it and you're the one that's hopefully going to get a trophy back with it. Your bullets, find a grain of bullet that works the best. Get the ballistics on this rifle. See what grain of bullet works the best in this rifle. What shoots the flattest, the fastest, hits the hardest. Choose that bullet and stick with it for target practice and for deer hunting. Don't be changing grains because you're going to see a big difference in the rise and fall of your of your bullets. Get out to your local rifle club, join it. Nothing any better than supporting a local rifle club. And practice, practice, practice makes perfect. Know where that rifle is shooting and be absolutely sure in your mind when you get a shot at a nice buck that you're going to put that bullet where it's supposed to be and make a good clean kill. And that's what it's all about. But you got to know your rifle. Safety common sense when you're in the woods. That's something you got to be thinking about all the time when you're hunting. You got to have the right safety equipment with you. You got to watch what you're doing at all times around tree stands, climbing trees. Make sure every move you make is what you think you're being as safe as you can be. There ain't no way of covering it all. But you got to have it in your mind at all times. And you make a foolish mistake like my friend Terry did, it's going to cost you big time, so be safe. This, for your own personal and enjoyment, your loved ones is looking for you to come home at the end of the day. They don't want to get no call saying you fell out of a tree or done some foolish thing that you knew better, and there you are in a mess. So you got to keep that in mind, your safety of it all. Road hunters, another great way to take some nice bucks, even though you can't get back in the backwoods, Lakey Lake too, probably, because of your age or your other obligations. Put your time in, find a spot that looks good, some good buck signs, get there as much as you can, put your time in, you're going to get one, guaranteed. Tree stands, 
If you're going to invest money in a good tree stand, get the top of the line, and as soon as you pay for that stand, the next question you ask the salesperson, where's your safety harnesses? Make sure if you're going up in these tree climbing stands, they have these summit ones, what one of my hunting partners use, that you can go up a tree just like an inchworm. And that safety harness is on the tree from the time you leave the bottom of the tree to you get up as high as you want to go and it's on you at all times. Something happens and you slip, you're safe. You ain't going to be any problems. That's one thing you've got to have is a good solid safety harness. Camp hunters. A lot of us in our younger years built these camps way back in the beyond the beaten trail and that's where we wanted to be. That's how we wanted to start our hunting careers and that's where I'm going to finish mine. If that's what you love and that's what you've done with your father and your grandfather over the years, don't change it. Don't change it. You stay in your backwoods and you do your thing because that is what I call backwoods hunting. You're away from the road. You don't hear nothing. Here and there a plane going overhead. That's it. No cars, no nothing. It's a beautiful spot to be and uh, that's where I want to be. Trail cameras, like I said, one of the best little devices to come out in a lot of years. You're seeing what's around your tree stand. Or where you find some nice box signs and set it up. You know he's there. There he is in your camera. There's a nice, big, healthy, mature buck. And he might have a spike horn or a 4.02 sniffing around there with him. That's the choice now that you can make. I ain't shooting that spike horn or that little 4.0. I'm a laying for that old big fella. That's conservation in a package right there. You're not going to waste your tag. I shouldn't say waste it on a spike horn or a four pointer. That's your license. If that's what you want to kill, go ahead and do it. But you're going to wait for that big fella you got on that trail camera. If you get him, good. A1. But at least you know if you didn't get him, you let that spike horn and that four pointer go. And next fall when you go back, the four pointer is going to be a six or maybe bigger. The spike horn is going to be a four or maybe bigger. So you're doing your own part in conservation right there. Hunting partner. There's nothing any more fun than having your hunting partners with you in the woods. I've done it for years. There used to be six of us. Go to the first camp and the camp was so small there was only two of us could eat at the table at one time but we loved every minute of it. And we still hunt together, some of us. We, so a lot of us are going our own ways now, getting older and stuff. But it's good to have a hunting partner with you and you know where he is and he knows where you am. You can hunt together. It'll move deer back and forth. One guy on one side of a ridge, one guy on another. And it really helps a lot of times. And there's nothing any better than sitting down in the evening to a backwoods camp, yarning off with your hunting buddies. That's a, one of the parts of deer hunting that everybody loves. In the fall of the year in a deer hunting camp, down in deer hunting yarns, either they're true or false, you have to make that decision. But the, Deer Sense, great products out there on the market today. Cover Sense, more or less the master human scent. Like I said before, I use, what little I use of it, I use what's called a scent killer. 99.9% .9 effective, they say it's guaranteed. Spray it on your boots at all times. That covers your scent from walking, coming and going to your tree stand. Spray it on your clothes, let it dry. They say it works for days. But you just can't come back to the camp and hang all this stuff up behind the stove, the wood stove with the smoke, the food, the food smells from cooking, the cigarette smoke and all the rest, and put it on the next day and, 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 and think you're going to go out in the woods and be scentless. You've got to keep this gear in a separate garbage bag hung out on the side of your camp or in your woodshed or whatever so that no other scents get on it. None. It's been sprayed down, you keep it that way by putting it in a separate garbage bag, even your boots together and the next day when you go out and go hunting you get this gear and you put it on. And that's good advice right there because that helps you. Deer don't smell you, he don't know you're there. Deer calls. Always have them with you. Some areas, 
drunk calls are deadly. Like I said, I know some of my hunting buddies got pretty near to the camp and found out they left the deer grunt home. They would leave and go home to get it because they know without it, their chances is cut down big time. So pick up the good multi-purpose grunt calls. They anywhere from a light squeak to uh, sound like a hog snorting, whatever, whatever you want. It's all there in one call. You can get your doe bleeps, your calf calls. And there's so many out there in the market, but now you got a little idea what I'm talking about. You make that decision on that and ask the store tender or, or keeper or whatever, you know, what's the best bleep call you got, what's your best grunt calls, and the whole deal. And make sure if you're going to do these things, do a little practicing before the season. Make sure you got the right read that's going to make, you don't want an old raspy sounding, don't you worry, they know each other calls. They know what, what's out there. And you want this call to sound as much like a buck grunting, if he makes a deep grunt or a light grunt, whatever. And your deer bleat, you want it sounding like a doe bleating because she's in heat and she's trying to uh, draw a buck into her. So, uh, and that's what you got to look for. Top of the line equipment, nothing else. Ain't gonna help you one bit. You got to have top of the line gear. Know your deer behavior. Deer will change from spring to summer to fall. They change the feeding habits, they change the bidding habits. In the summer months, when the fur is thin on them, they're out next to the lakes and the open meadows where the breeze and wind can get on them and keep the flies and mosquitoes off them. And when early fall comes, the hair on the body is going to start getting dense off for the cool weather coming. They'll change the habit. So you learn how these animals change the habits and you can stay with them year round. They'll move from one feed to another. Acorns start falling. They're going to be in the hardwood. Mushrooms start growing in the big woods after a rainstorm. They're going to be in there after the mushrooms. So you got to be going around looking for these signs, looking for these habits at all times. If you love deer hunting, it's not work. It's, it's a passion. You love doing it. Find the All right, you get out in the woods in early September, early October, be looking for these signs. You see a, 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 a hawking, brand new hawking on an altar or a little tree. You say, man, they starting early this fall. Well, maybe that's not the case. Maybe they're just getting the velvet off the horns from late summer. They have to rub this velvet off and shine them horns up to look pretty for the girls. So that's telling you he's in the area. You see his hooking line. Then you're going to be finding a little later in the month and the moon comes full. He's going to start down putting some scrapes down for the pre rot and you, I see these as early as the 10th, 12th of October some years if we get a cool fall. So be looking for these things. Keep, keep watch of this stuff. That's telling you he's there. Now the rest is up to you. What I've just told you in this summarized version I'm doing here for you. You got the weapon. You know it's working and you know how to shoot it. You got the gear. You got everything with you. You know he's there. The rest is up to you. Now the last thing I want to touch on here is respect conservation, like I just got done telling you a little earlier. You've got to start realizing that if we kill them all, what's going to be left for the rest of the hunters? <coughs> if you got it in your mind, you got a tag, a rifle hunting tag with you. And you want to let the spike horns and the four pointers go, that's the decision you're going to make. It's your tag. And go after that big button you might not get in this fall. You might not get him next fall, but while you're waiting to get him, the ones that you let go, they're growing up now. They're soon going to be up in that same rank, nice big six and eight, ten pointers. So you know that you're doing your part in the area you're hunting in to let some of these smaller bucks grow up. And within two or three years, you're going to be hunting all nice bucks in that area. And after a while, he's going to come in your, he's going to come in your scope. And there he is, and you can say, gee, that looks a lot like that flake horn I let go three, four years ago. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if you believe it, and you get him, you're going to feel way prouder for it. So, so that's the summary that we've uh, pretty well covered everything I guess we got to cover.